Good afternoon and welcome to another Waukegan History Museum History Lunch and Learn. My name is Ty Rohr. I'm the manager of cultural arts for the Waukegan Park District and I also work on behalf of the Waukegan Historical Society. Happy May Day to you all out there and I hope everyone is doing well. We did make it through April a unique one, in fact, history-wise. And here in Illinois, the stay-at-home order is extended through May, so I will continue these virtual history lunch and learns on Fridays at noon during that time. And I sent out a request for future history lunch and learn topics and received some great feedback from you folks out there. I'm still not sure yet, what the upcoming schedule will be this month, but I will be sharing stories on the Waukegan Lighthouses and also a story on sugar refinery explosions here in Waukegan. And I'll have a few other topics to share as well. Today, though, I am telling the story of the fascinating events that led up to Al Capone finding himself in Waukegan. Actually, this story is about Capone and another notorious gangster, Johnny Torrio, and their Waukegan connection. So first, let me introduce you to Johnny Torrio. Johnny Torrio was born in Italy in a village near Naples in February of 1882. Torrio's father, Thomas, died when he was two years old, died when uh, Johnny was two years old. And Thomas had worked in a vineyard for 20 years and had been saving money for his family to immigrate to the United States. After his father's passing, Johnny and his mother moved to New York City. Johnny's mother remarried Salvatore Caputo, and Caputo ran an illegal bar at 86 Jane Street in Manhattan. And Johnny spent his childhood working at the unlicensed saloon. As a teenager, Johnny Torrio joined a local gang. Even at his young age, Torrio was known for being cautious. He did pull off thefts and muggings, but he did them alone and again, very cautiously, and he avoided being caught. At the age of 22, Torrio, under the alias J.T. McCarthy, purchased a bar at James and Walker Streets in New York, and he used the upper floors of the building as a brothel. To protect his business, he hired a number of notoriously brutal thugs. This eventually formed into the mob known as the James Street Gang. This gang was allied with the Five Points Gang under the leadership of Paul Kelly. Kelly became a mentor to Torrio. In fact, Torrio started to imitate Kelly and even started to dress in fancy suits like him. With the new look, some of the young members of the James Street Gang in turn started to mimic Torrio and became his apprentices. One of these apprentices was Al Capone. Al Capone was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1899. He quit school after the sixth grade and joined Torrio's James Street Gang. Torrio taught Capone and others how to stealthily pick pockets, burglarize, and murder. He also taught them how to terrorize people who worked for them, mainly prostitutes, and terrorize them into giving back all of their nightly earnings. Torrio, being the very cautious man that he was, allowed Capone and others to gain fame and influence while he stayed in the shadows. Torrio paid his gang off of their spoils from various jobs, along with free booze and prostitutes. In 1908, the mob war between the Five Points and Eastman gangs intensified with over 100 dead in a three-month period. The Democratic Party political machine, Tammany Hall, 
ordered the two gangs to end their war. Torrio's James Street Gang was allied with Five Points, and he decided to disband after the war an edict from above. For the next year, Torrio was extorting money from wealthy Italian businessmen. He was also operating the Harvard Inn, and this was a notorious saloon that was the scene of several murders. This type of work was too dangerous for the overly cautious Torrio, so he looked for a new opportunity. Opportunity was Chicago, Illinois. Torrio had a cousin, Victoria Moresco, who just so happened to be married to, be married to Big Jim Colissimo, the boss of the criminal empire in Chicago. Colissimo needed help running his business, and Torrio was the perfect man for the job. One of the first things that Colissimo asked Torrio to do was kill some people who were extorting him. Torrio was not a proponent of violence, and he first tried to talk the men who were extorting Colissimo. Torrio found that these men would not back down. Torrio agreed to pay their terms of $50,000 and invited them to come back the next night to collect. Torrio, or someone working for him, shot and killed each extortionist the next night. Colissimo asked Torrio what had happened, and Torrio replied, I looked back, and they didn't wave goodbye. Colissimo approved of Torrio's tactics, and he appointed him to be his right-hand man. Torrio oversaw some of the more dilapidated establishments in Colissimo's empire, and he had a small office at the Four Deuces on State Street. Torrio paid guards to stand watch outside of his office to protect him. But Torrio caught wind, though, of one of the guards being paid off to kill him. Torrio needed someone that he could trust, so he sent for Al Capone. The request from Torrio asking Capone to come join him in Chicago came at a good time for the New York gangster. Capone had recently killed a prostitute using some of the methods that he had been taught by Torrio, and he was also about to be charged for a separate gang murder. Al Capone arrived in Chicago in 1918 and was given the job of bouncer at the Four Deuces at a pay of $35 a week. Capone called Torrio Johnny Papa, and he was grateful to have the opportunity to work for him again and to get out of New York. By the time Prohibition had gone into effect, Capone had made his reputation in Chicago with his brutal tactics. Capone realized the opportunity that Prohibition provided in the form of bootlegging, and he shared these thoughts with Torrio. Torrio then went to get approval from Colissimo to get into the bootlegging business. Colissimo refused the request. Colissimo felt that their empire was successful enough with their gambling houses and prostitution rings. In early May of 1920, Colissimo married his second wife after having deserted Torrio's cousin, Victoria. On May 11th, when Colissimo returned from the wedding, Torrio called to inform him about a shipment that was about to arrive to his cafe. As Colissimo was waiting in the vestibule of his cafe, he was ambushed and gunned down. Most reports have Al Capone firing the fatal shot while hiding in a nearby phone booth. Torrio and Capone were now in charge of Colissimo's Chicago outfit. Everything was going rather smoothly for around two years with the Chicago outfit supplying most of the bootlegged alcohol to other gangs around the city. Torrio was bringing in $100 million a year with 25% of it going to Capone. Now other gangs started to challenge Torrio and Capone. Most were subdued or killed by Capone or through his aggression in some way. 
But the gang started to continue to push, and they were greedy. They, these gangs, too, were put back in line with Capone's shotgun. But the Chicago gang wars were starting to erupt. Torrio, again, never one to look towards violence as the first option to solving a problem, hoped for negotiations to be successful. The Northside gang, led by Dion O'Banion, became a problem for Torrio. The Northside gang was hijacking liquor shipments coming to the Chicago outfit. Torrio kept Capone from attacking the Northside gang as he tried to mediate the situation. Some of the Chicago outfit men were killed, and Capone was ready to take action, but again, Torrio talked him down. O'Banion came to visit Torrio and Capone in May of 1924. O'Banion told them that he was tired of the racket. He offered Torrio to give up his controlling interest to the ship. The ship was the largest gambling spa in Chicago, and it was jointly owned by Torrio, Capone, and O'Banion. O'Banion also offered to sell Torrio his finest brewery, Siebens. These offers were welcomed by Torrio as he saw a peaceful way out of the gang wars. Torrio agreed to meet O'Banion at the Siebens Brewery two days later on May 19, 1924, to meet for a building inspection. Torrio and O'Banion were only in the brewery for 10 minutes when the police raided the place. O'Banion and Tory were arrested for violating prohibition laws. This was the first arrest for O'Banion violating the prohibition laws, but for Torrio, it was his second. As Torrio looked at the smile on O'Banion's face, he realized that he had been set up. O'Banion knew that the police were about to seize the property, and he may have even tipped them off that Torrio would be inside that day. Torrio knew that O'Banion would only get a fine for this being his first offense, but with this being his second, well, it meant a jail sentence. Torrio plotted against O'Banion and waited for five months to get his revenge. Three of Torrio's men arrived to O'Banion's flower shop under the pretense of buying flowers. Yes. O'Banion owned a flower shop, and Dion O'Banion was working at the shop that day. One man of Torrio's gang came up to O'Banion to shake his hand. While shaking his hand, the other two with him shot O'Banion at close range. This was known as the handshake murder. O'Banion's death brought upon revenge from the North Siders on Torrio. On the evening of November 10th, 1924, Torrio and his wife had just gotten out of their limousine in front of their home. Torrio's wife, Anna, began to go in the house while Torrio stopped to pick up some packages from a shopping trip. A black Cadillac pulled up next to the curb and two men armed with shotguns and pistols jumped out. Jaime Weiss and Bugs Moran started firing at Torrio. Torrio instantly fell with the bullet in his neck and chest. Weiss and Moran fired a bullet into Torrio's right arm and another into his groin. Moran took aim at Torrio's head for the fatal shot, but when he pulled the trigger, the gun was empty. As Moran was putting a new clip in his gun, the driver of the Cadillac signaled frantically with the car horn that they needed to leave. Moran and Weiss raced to the car before firing another shot at Torrio. Johnny Torrio survived this attack. He, of course, knew each of the men that attacked him, but he never told the authorities their names. A few months later, on February 9, 1925, Torrio, with his neck and jaw still bandaged, stood before federal judge Adam Cliff. Torrio was convicted of operating Siebens Brewery and was given a nine-month jail sentence to be served in the DuPage County Jail in Wheaton. 
Torrio's counsel, though, asked for their client to be sent to the Lake County Jail in Waukegan instead. They stated that Torrio would get better medical care there for his recent wounds than at the DuPage County Jail. Torrio knew that he had barely survived the attack by Moran and the North Siders, and he feared that if he was sent to the jail in Wheaton, that he would be killed there, as Moran had connections with that jail. And Torrio's request was granted. Now he was off to the Lake County Jail in Waukegan. From all accounts, Johnny Torrio had a rather nice stay while in Waukegan. His jail cell was fitted with bulletproof plating and extra deputies guarded him throughout the night. Torrio was able to bring in comforts to his cell, including easy chairs and even throw rugs. But that's not all. You see, all of the special treatment was coordinated by Edwin Alstrom, who was the Lake County Sheriff at the time. Edwin Alstrom was born in Waukegan on May 10, 1893, and he was a lifelong resident. As a youth, he was considered to be an athlete of considerable note in baseball and football. He played on some of the best baseball teams in the area and was known around town for hitting the longest home run at McCann's Park. Sheriff Alstrom allowed for more than just a comfy cell for Johnny Torrio. Torrio ate many of his meals at the sheriff's home and was allowed to stay there for hours on end to relax. Torrio's wife was able to visit and spend time with him at the sheriff's house. Key associates also could come and meet with Torrio in private at the sheriff's home. And yes, Al Capone came to Waukegan on numerous occasions to meet with Torrio at the sheriff's house to have dinner and discuss the operations of the Chicago outfit. Now, this isn't maybe as scandalous as it sounds, for the sheriff's house was actually connected to the Lake County Jail. So it's not as if Torrio ever went very far, but still was getting a little different treatment than other uh, inmates at that jail at the time, or probably before or after as well. Time in the Lake County Jail allowed for Torrio to reflect on his life. He realized that he had been lucky up to that point, but it was time to leave the racket, time to leave Chicago. He had amassed an estimated fortune of $75 million, and he was ready to be done with it all. After getting out of the Lake County Jail, Torrio was back in Chicago. He called a meeting with his friend and associate Al Capone and also had their lawyers attend. At this meeting, Torrio transferred all of his holdings to Capone. This including the bootlegging empire, casinos, saloons, prostitution ring, and more. Torrio told Capone, I'm through. It's all yours, Al. I'm going back to Italy if I can get out of this city alive. Torrio and Capone shook hands, and this, was, this, of course, leads Capone down the path of the story of the most infamous gangster. A story for another time, though. Capone made sure that his friend, Papa Johnny, made it out of Chicago safely. Torrio and his wife were taken to the train station in Gary, Indiana, in Capone's armor-plated limo, surrounded by heavily armored roadsters. As the Torrios traveled the country, they were pursued by gangsters of the North Siders, but they finally did make it to Italy. The Torrios were there for three years, but Johnny Torrio found life there to be born. After Mussolini had stated that he was going to round up the gangsters that had returned to Italy, the Torrios decided to go back to the United States. Torrio decided on returning to New York instead of Chicago, since he did not have a police record there. In New York, Torrio went into the real estate business while still coordinating the mob's liquor cartel that ran along the East Coast. 
He became the elder statesman of the crime syndicate and was often the mediator to determine disputes among the gang members. After Prohibition, Torrio continued success, but on April 22, 1936, he was arrested on charges of income tax evasion. He was convicted and would spend the next two and a half years in prison at Leavenworth. Torrio was paroled on April 14, 1941, and from there he went into semi-retirement. For the next 16 years, he would live a quiet life. On April 16, 1957, he entered a barber shop for a shave. Sitting in the barber's chair, he groaned in pain from a heart attack and slipped from the chair. Torrio died six hours later at Cumberland Hospital with Anna at his side. As for Al Capone, well, like I said, another story for another time, but I bet you already know it. Edwin Alstrom was Lake County Sheriff from 1922 to 1926. He was not reelected in 1926 as his reputation had taken a hit after he had been fined by federal court for taking two girls to a dancing party. The problem was that the girls were in his custody as sheriff and they were there as federal white slave prisoners. Alstrom admitted to taking the girls to the party, but he claimed it was a public reception and dance in North Chicago in honor of public officials in the city. Alstrom declared that it was a conspiracy against him, and ultimately he was set up. Alstrom would later be appointed chief of Waukegan Police in December of 1930. Four years later, he became the chief of John's Manville Police Force, and he held this position when he died unexpectedly at the age of 45 on September 29, 1938. So that's the story of notorious gangsters Al Capone and Johnny Torrio and why they were in Waukegan. Now, yes, there are other connections to Capone, uh, those Chicago gangs to the area. Uh, the Mineola Hotel has wonderful stories other stories in the western part of Lake County. And I know some of those historical societies out there have shared some of those stories, even recently, uh, just last year, for uh, the Best Dunn Museum uh, History Symposium. Uh, so you might be able to find some of that information um, through their websites or connecting them as well. On behalf of the Waukegan Park District and the Waukegan Historical Society, thank you again for joining me for another Waukegan History Museum Lunch and Learn. I will be on again next Friday at noon with another Waukegan history story. Again, I don't know which one I'm going to tell yet, but uh, I'll post that probably uh, Monday morning. Everyone have a great weekend, and I look forward to talking about the past with you again in the future. This is Tyroar, signing off.